Welcome to our webcast, a Network Foundation Applied Case Study in Deploying a Reliable Physical Infrastructure for Process, sponsored by Panduit. I'm your moderator, Mark Hosky, and I'm happy to join you today on behalf of Control Engineering. To get the best results from the Control Engineering webcast platform, please make note of the following as you participate in today's event. If you're having technical problems with the audio or the slide presentation, click on the question mark at the top right-hand corner of your screen to bring up a list of system checks to make before escalating to an online technician. If you're experiencing issues with your slides or audio, please refresh your browser or click the Refresh Media button directly under the presenter's headshot. You can control the volume settings of the webcast by adjusting the volume on your computer or by adjusting the volume on the webcast platform. If you do need a technician, type a message into the Ask a Question box and someone will get back to you as quickly as possible. Individual technical questions will be answered in the Answered Questions area on the left side of your screen. You can use the Ask a Question box on the left side of your screen to type in questions for the speakers during the presentation for the Q&A session at the end. You may ask questions at any time during the presentation. We'll get to as many as the time allows. Questions that are for today's presenters will be answered verbally during the Q&A session at the end of the webcast. To download the presentation slides, or if you'd like to download a certificate of completion from today's event, use the event resources on the left side of your screen. The webcast is being recorded, including the Q&A session. We'll post the archive on the Control Engineering website in a few days, and we'll send you an email message with a link connecting directly to it after it's ready. Today's webcast sponsor is Panduit. Thank you for supporting this program. Now I'm happy to introduce today's distinguished speakers. Jim Niewetti show, uh, shows Panduit Professional Services customers how to bridge the gap between IT and automation with a structured approach to distributed systems deployment. He is a globally recognized facilitator, sales strategist, and value-added industry expert with 25 years of experience developing and delivering solutions that span all levels of the information and automation supply chain including manufacturing execution systems, manu management information systems, customer relationship management, and enterprise resource planning. Jim has helped establish industry-leading visions, strategies, tactics, and programs for industrial automation, and is the author of numerous articles in a variety of industry publications. publications. Alan McFarlane has over 25 years experience in telecommunications physical infrastructure installation and design. At AT&T, Allen sold and designed large, complex cabling backbone systems for customers, including institutions of higher education, medical facilities, government agencies, and Fortune 500 companies. He has designed a large fiber optic, net fiber optic network to connect all of the buildings of a major city government, and in the process discovered ways to reroute and repurpose existing pathways saving the customer over $100,000. Asked to review another city's design for an uninterruptible power supply system for the IT department, Allen discovered that due to deficiencies in the design, the system would not provide adequate power during an outage and determined that the design included mismatched components. Allen redesigned the system, saving the customer approximately 15% and prevented them from deploying an ineffective system. I'm Mark T. Hosky, webcast moderator and content manager for Control Engineering since 1994. Before we continue, please take a moment to remind yourself about dealing with the te technical issues during the presentation. And now, uh, Jim will start the presentation. Thank you very much, Mark. Today we're going to be talking about how to deploy a reliable physical infrastructure. We're going to be talking about the steps and processes that are required to deploy a reliable physical infrastructure, and then we're going to go through a case study that shows how these steps uh, work in a real-world example. So 
So what is the physical infrastructure? Well, that is the communication, connection. Um, oftentimes, it's the transmission of power um, to automation components. As part of Panduit, we help customers implement and validate industrial networks, and we help them utilize IT structure techniques along with uh, controls, understanding, and apply the industry best practices. We're going to be talking about the business trends first, and then we're going to talk about the vision of uh, what your network needs to be today and the process for turning that vision into something that will support your future needs as well. We'll take that and break this down into steps such as a physical assessment and design processes, show you the building blocks that we utilize and the standards that need to be applied, and then we'll talk about this in the context of a case study. So every organization today is being challenged to transform, and we need to understand that business growth and technology are very strongly linked. This is a trend that's uh, going to be continuing in the future, and it's really imperative for the future of manufacturing and process organizations. Ms. Kinsey uh, has characterized the markets for us in North America and Europe, and they uh, show that those who do it smarter, those companies who have a better business model, will be able to reap the benefits of innovation and this business agility. So this is being all motivated by the Internet of Things. The evidence is all around us. There are more and more devices that are being connected up into the, uh, the Internet and into your plant floor Ethernet. Ethernet is becoming much more pervasive. There's an estimate that says 100% uh, of all plant floor devices are going to be providing some sort of data over your Ethernet by 2018. Every day, there's 160,000 new industrial Ethernet nodes that are connected. The Internet of Things is going to really enable manufacturers to generate higher profits. It's really going to help them take advantage of the uh, new technologies and the industrial IP networks will become a network fabric that's going to easily and securely connect vital services. Now these services are going to include things like wireless and cloud, video, well, remote and mobile access devices, energy management, safety, and the list goes on and on. And all of these are going to make companies much more competitive and it's going to add a lot of value. So this is the role of the industrial network. And we need to be cognizant that these networks are going to become more and more complex. And so we need to adapt our processes and how we design, install, maintain these networks and that way we can reduce our risks and reap the rewards and opportunities that are provided to us by the Internet of Things. We also see that industrial networks are becoming more of a disciplined standard. Um, there's new uh, methodologies, methodologies that are being leveraged to build these networks and make sure that these networks are reliable. Uh, as a case in point, um, Aberdeen has done some research and helped us profile the best-in-class manufacturers, and they've provided us some industry averages as well as those who are lagging behind. And there's a lot of different areas that are covered, but I want to just focus on the importance of physical layer business performance. 
So what's revealed here is that you know the best performers are actually uh, putting more and more emphasis on uptime, their total cost of network management, uh, taking better steps for network reliability, resilience. They're putting in things like redundant devices, switches, routers, power supplies, making sure that no single device or link is going to take down the network and cause uh, downtime. So this is really the overall importance of the network. And you can see that the, uh, the leaders here are spending a lot of effort on their cabling and their network management and making sure that their network is very, very reliable. And an infrastructure is critical to meeting your performance goals. And we're going to give you some methodologies so that you can reach these same results. So if we look at the typical money spent on the network and on IT in general, yeah, software is at the top where 60% of the budget goes to software. And the life cycle is really only two to five years. Your networking switches and routers um, you know, it's 23% of a typical budget, and those have a refresh every five years. Your operations, um, your operation PIM management, things like that, those are lasting about five years, and they scale along with the networking. But our cabling is only 7% of the budget, yet people are getting 20 plus years for, out of this. So it's kind of upside down that we've got something that lasts so long but really has such a small percentage of the budget. On top of that, if we look at you know the, a number of uh, problems that are caused by not taking care of your network cabling and your infrastructure, there's nearly 80% of your network problems can get translated back to this cabling issue. So, it's really important that you know we uh, put this cabling in properly. We make sure that we have a, a good utilization of our capital budgets and things like that. And we need to really take care of something that's going to be around for a long time. So it really pays to be looking forward when you're planning and designing your cabling systems. So this is uh, another graphic, and we're trying to show here is that if you can address a problem early in the life cycle, it costs a lot less than if you wait until it's deployed. Here we're taking a, a $10 um, you know, issue, and we're showing that if we address it in the planning stage, it's very inexpensive, but if it goes to the design, now it costs $100. If we've actually started building something, now we're up to you know $1,000. And if it's actually an operation deployment, it goes up to maybe worth uh, you know $10,000. So the summary of this is that really um, you need to be uh, addressing these issues early on their life cycle. You need to have a really good network design, you know, guided by standards. And it's very important that you design in the reliability and you help you know, reduce your risk right from the moment that you start conceptualizing your network. So that's kind of the, the state of the state. That's um, what the industry trends are. And we're going to now kind of talk about how do we establish a network vision and turn this into reality. And so this is a primer for you know, physical design of a network and deployment. So we're going to touch on some physical considerations. Um, how do you move from a logical network and merge into your physical design? Um, how we do network assessments to ascertain uh, the performance and issues that we may have with our present network. 
We're going to talk about some standards and how they relate to uh, uh, network requirements. And this will all be a, a good starting point, and then I'm going to turn this over um, to talk about a case study we have with a leading metal manufacturer. So first thing we do with a, um, an existing uh, installation is we'll do an assessment. And so the assessment would, you know, consist of doing a cable walkthrough. Um, you know, look at the distances, look at the environment, obstructions. Then we'll ask questions about, well, how critical is this network? What's the cost for your downtime? The number of connections you have today and how many you're going to have tomorrow? The type of bandwidth that you're going to be utilizing um, today and tomorrow. You know, what's your data um, usage? Who has to have the data? What's the, the importance of having real-time actionable information at different levels, whether that's for, you know, doing control or uh, process optimization, or maybe even putting video in there so that you can look at key processes, how they're performing in real time. And we shouldn't uh, ever neglect security. Security is becoming a much more prevalent issue and being able to control our, our physical environment and limit access um, is very important. So as part of the assessment, we're going to take into a lot of different considerations. You know, we're going to try to balance the, the costs, um, make sure that we are putting a, uh, the importance where it's needed. Um, so we'll come up with a, a network topology that helps address the, your needs. Um, you know, you need to, to look at your availability, and also you need to look at making sure it uh, has a degree of separation um, and you have redundant media paths. You need to look at what kind of uh, hardening is needed to make sure that your, your cabling is not susceptible uh, to to breakage or damage, make sure you've got the right type of cable jackets, the right type of enclosures to protect it. Um, what is your uh, expected network performance? You know, are you going to um, have, you know, issues where you're going to be able to miss shipments and so that a uh, errors such as bit rate data errors or things like that will have, you know, downstream costs uh, for your manufacturing? So you know, if you look in the picture here, if you imagine a, a network cable is running along the floor and you had this forklift driver went on by, he uh, potentially just severed your network. So you know, do you have redundancy in your paths, not just in your individual media? So to design a network, um, we're going to show the logical architecture here that we call the CPWE. And it takes advantage of the Ethernet IP um, at different uh, levels. And the focus for the uh, CPWE, the converged plant-wide Ethernet model, um, is really to ensure that we have the right level of networking implementation at all levels. So we show the MES levels of uh, 0 to 2 on the bottom, which is everything from your device up into your supervisory system. And then you move up into your control room for level 3. And then there's a DMZ that then bridges into our enterprise zone. So this is a, the type of model that has been validated by um, Rockwell Automation and Cisco. And there's a guidance, a reference architecture that Panduit uh, helped publish with them. And it uh, helps us determine the right type of network that's needed, whether it's a redundant star topology, like on the lower left, or whether we're talking about a redundant resilient ring or whether we, a star or bus topology is suitable. And also very important is who owns the architecture, who's going to be maintaining it, and then also the environment that you're going to be 
running the different levels of this architecture through. So here's what we see when we actually go out and look at some of these uh, uh, implementations. So you can see that these have grown over time. Um, there hasn't been a lot of care. It's a, a, a rat's nest if you have to do troubleshooting or maintaining, not to mention that there is potential problems here. Um, bend radiuses haven't been protected. Um, there's possibilities for cables being damaged. Um, enclosure doors can't be shut. So now you have switches are exposed to harsher environments than they need to be. Uh, the list goes on and on. And then when we look at the, uh, the other requirements, there's some other observations that we notice too, is that the controls and the operation teams who are managing the the day-to-day -day production aren't necessarily on the same page with IT. And so a lot of times uh, I, I say we're a, a English to English translation service because we help translate the controls requirements to the IT requirements. And a lot of times um, these two groups don't understand the needs that each uh, team has, and there's a lot of issues that are overlooked, and we can help guide them, uh, help them address some of the strategic issues, and give them some strategies to help mitigate those before they become a problem. So when we go out into a, a facility and we do an assessment, we see things a little bit differently than most people do. Um, you know, we've, our eyes and perspective is a little different, and that is the same with manufacturing and IT. They can look at the same situation, but they see it from different eyes. So it's really important to have an assessment um, if you've got a um, brownfield type uh, activity where you're trying to expand your network. Um, it's very important to understand what you can keep what you need to throw away. And having a, a strategy to do that and having both parties on the same sheet of music, so to speak, is very important. So let's talk now about some of the industry standards that are required for a, a good deployment. Um, in the, the TIA standards and also ODBA, um, they reference this concept called MICE. And, uh, and there will be different MICE levels based upon uh, the environment and conditions in the plant floor. So you need to have the right products and, um, and network architecture and distribution system based upon the level of, uh, of communications as well as the individual mice requirements. Let me uh, go through this just a little bit more and talk about this is you know as part of a structured cabling system. So mice is a, an acronym and it stands for mechanical, ingress, climactic, chemical, and electromagnetic. And if you were in an office environment, your mice level would be an M1, I1, C1, E1. But if you move uh, into a, a different area, your, um, your mice level will change. So as we move to the factory floor out of our IT environment or back office environment, now our factory floor shows an M1, I1, C2, E2, because we have now um, you know, environmental, climactic, temperature problems, um, and issues there, as well as electromagnetic interference potentially. And then if we move into the automation island, closer to where there's VFDs um, and maybe high temperature type processes, uh, vibration, et cetera, now all of a sudden in the work area and automation island, our mice area moves to an M1 I2 for the, uh, the dust and maybe a C3 
because of the uh, hazardous chemicals involved and an E2 for electromagnetic from your robotics uh, drives and things like that. And then even within that work area, you can have pockets where it may even be uh, a very harsh, the harshest industrial environment where now all the levels are marked as, uh, as threes. So with that, I'm going to turn this um, on over to Alan McFarland. And Alan's now going to kind of talk to us about some of the other standards that are applicable. Um, Alan is an RCDD, so he is a uh, registered communication data designer. And he'll be talking about the standards and then the, uh, the best practices for designing and deploying a network. All right, thanks, Jim. Uh, appreciate that. So when we're talking about assessments or designs, what we're doing is we're making sure that we're compliant to all industry standards that are associated with uh, the specific areas of the plant. So whether it's a industrial environment or an enterprise environment or a data center for that matter, there are a whole host of standards that are applicable to each of those uh, spaces. And uh, the whole host of these, uh, and there's a few of them that we've shown here, they're icons of these agencies off to the right. But underneath each one, there are, are various sub-standards or specific standards to any given uh, functional area of, of any network. So what we've talked about so far is uh, up above, there's, a, there's actually an excerpt from what's called the TIA 1005A standard, which is specifically to the industrial environment. But uh, it's important also to understand that there is really no single standard that covers all issues in any plant environment or any enterprise environment, for that matter. And not only that, but there's, uh, it's not that every standard is applicable to each space in any given situation. So it's kind of a puzzle to, to determine, you know, what standards are, are need to be recognized and, and be in compliance to when you're evaluating a specific area or a space in a plant. So you have to know what standards apply, and you have to understand where they, where they apply and how they're to be used. Uh, for example, in an industrial environment, may have uh, the need for cabling that leaves a building and goes out into another building. So there's an outside plant element that's included in that. So there's a specific standard for that in uh, TIA 758. Uh, if there's a data center involved, there's TIA 942. And the list goes on and on. There's a specific TIA standard for labeling, for pathways and spaces, and for grounding and bonding. So it's important to understand the specific area that you're looking at and which standards apply to that so that we're uh, designing that to be in compliance with those uh, associated and appropriate standards that are needed. So one of the things that we have done is uh, in a, in a uh, one of our models was uh, through some activities, as Jim mentioned before, with Cisco and Rockwell Automation. Uh, what we've been able to do with that is provide joint engineering and product development. So as the electronic and switch manufacturers of the world come up with new technologies, we align that with specific uh, physical infrastructure components that are enabled to support those. Uh, these are tested with uh, full interoperability uh, so that they're actually tried and true. So once they're actually deployed uh, in a customer's environment, they're, they're known to be functional and work correctly. Uh, the enhanced infrastructure design is, is, is intended to make sure that the customer is receiving the adequate bandwidth and performance characteristics they need not only for day one, but as they uh, grow and their business needs change down the line. Uh, so these corporations are requiring these upgrades to make sure that their operations function correctly. So one of the keys to doing this, uh, when we talk specifically about either assessments or designs, is to really uh, plan the project. And that's a key element of this. So uh, as we know, industrial Ethernet is evolving. And it can't rely on traditional, uh, what, what sometimes is referred to as tribal IT knowledge. In other words, legacy cabling systems. The image uh, previous to this, you saw some of those uh, 
I guess, atrocities with the cabling system and things like that. And that's pretty common. We see a lot, a lot of that. And, you know, that's because these networks were installed many, many years ago, and they were added onto over the course of many years since. So uh, it wasn't planned for that type of capacity or that need at the time they were originally installed. But as customers are uh, moving into more of an Ethernet platform, it's really requiring uh, a lot better, I guess, design cabling system, structured cabling system that will enable them to manage the network both in day one and day two. So when we look at how we assess a specific plant or, or a space, uh, we take into consideration product specification. So we want to make sure that the products we're specifying are uh, appropriate to be placed in the environments they are, depending on how harsh those environments are. So we reference back to that MICE standard for some of that. Uh, also, the switch selection and the switch placement. You know, a lot of times we'll see uh, enterprise-grade uh, switches out in uh, wall-mounted cabinets that were intended to be placed in a controlled uh, environment, but they're actually out in a very hot and dusty or, or you know, you know, very bad environmental situation. So it's not really appropriate for that. So we take into consideration all of that. Um, and when we look at a, a, a design, we go into it with the understanding that we want to provide the customer with what they need, not only for day one, but whatever they might need down the line for day two. So we ask this question. So, for example, even if we're uh, contracted to uh, provide some design elements for a specific production area of a plant, um, we want to make sure that we're not designing just that one production area that, you know, two years down the line they need to expand it and it wasn't really suitable for expansion. So we try and look ahead as much as we can and, and you know, within reason make sense of, of the capacity of the fiber that we select or specify and make sure that uh, it's, it's going to be reusable and sustainable for other upgrades that may be coming down the line. Um, often we'll do a complete plant-wide design knowing that the customer might not have the budget to actually execute or implement that design completely day one but it's laid out in a, in a means that he can do it in phases, and as budget money is released, he can build this network over and over again uh, to where once it's complete, it's actually done in a holistic method and not just fragmented and put together sort of in piece parts. So here's one of the examples of uh, what we call our building block approach and how we do this. And uh, the image that you see to the left is a topology that was used on a specific project that we did. Uh, it had a central IT server room that had to connect to multiple buildings. So here again was where we had an outside plant element uh, of cabling going from one building to multiple other buildings. Uh, this particular customer wanted a self-healing ring, so we provided redundant backbones between uh, not only between the server room and each of the micro data center locations, but from MDC to MDC to provide a, a second level of redundancy. At each MDC location, we cabled uh, some fiber connections out to zone enclosures. And this is basically where we come from an MDC to a zone enclosure, providing pretty much a permanent structured cable system that can remain no matter what happens with the dynamics of the actual plant floor. So if it were, say, for example, an auto manufacturer where every few years they change models and they have to redo machinery, a lot of that stuff can be changed, but the actual locations of these zone enclosures can remain because they're within a logistic uh, distance to support anything that comes out of those. Uh, so that becomes part of a permanent network, and overall that becomes a very high-value asset to the customer in, in allowing them to be able to uh, modify the uh, plant operations as they need to. So the uh, building blocks start with uh, the micro data center, which is uh, usually fed out to the IT server room, and then from there we break out into zone enclosures, and then from there we uh, typically it's a copper uh, horizontal cable that comes out from the zone enclosures out to individual control panels. And that particular uh, cabling topology winds up becoming the most dynamic if the needs of the plant change over time. This is another example of a, uh, a different customer that had a very, very high uh, critical, mission critical network, and they needed uh, a very 
high level of redundancy. So you can see with all of these uh, connection points that they had a backup microdata center and a primary microdata center. They were each connected uh, with separate fibers on separate paths. Then from there, we uh, specified a, a higher strand count of fiber connectivity to aggregation points so that we could reduce the amount of fiber needed to actually feed out to all these zone enclosures. Uh, but also, each zone enclosure needed its own redundancy so that it could be directly fed. So if you were to actually follow any zone enclosure back, you would see that you had multiple paths to get to not only the main uh, MDC location, but the backup MDC location. So if any single one or even two of those connections might have been severed, you would have a, a very strong likelihood that your network would still be up and running and performing. So we're going to talk a little bit about the case study that Jim alluded to earlier. <clears throat> Excuse me, and it was a uh, large metal uh, manufacturing plant. And they had some pretty uh, significant challenges. They had a very flat network that was built over time. It was a joint use network with their business LAN. And uh, then all of a sudden, all the process control Ethernet started to ride on the same physical network. And the corporate mandate was to physically separate these networks uh, for a variety of reasons, not only reliability, but also for security. So uh, the existing infrastructure that we looked at was not up to current standards, and it was uh, not going to be able to support this migration. So there was a lot of challenges with that, including uh, where do we put these new cabinets? Where can we build these new rooms? And uh, you know, how little amount of space can we uh, re require to do this and uh, to do this as quickly as possible? So also the customer at the time really had no strategic plan in place in order to execute this uh, requirement. So his original intention was to just really just string a whole bunch of new fiber all around the plant and connect it, you know, ad hoc as, as, as best he could to, to physically separate this network, which in short term may have been uh, effective to satisfy the goals of, the, of the, the company requirement, but long term would not have been very uh, manageable for him to expand and grow into. So um, he didn't really have the complete bandwidth uh, and technical expertise in order to do this. In a, in a holistic manner, which we're going to illustrate here in just a bit. So again, the business objectives were uh, pretty key. Uh, they needed to ensure the quality improvements. Um, they wanted to be able to have predictable maintenance. In other words, they needed uh, notifications of things that were going down. Their existing switching architecture didn't allow them to have visibility to a lot of those things. Um, so they needed a lot of enhancements, plus they were also talking about, as Jim mentioned before, the uh, deployment of uh, video surveillance, not only for plant personnel security, but also for the actual process uh, control and some video reporting back to their control center. Uh, so they needed a lot higher visibility of all the activities of the process network, and uh, they needed to improve energy utilization. So they didn't want to put switches out at every location where it needed it. They wanted to be able to economize as much as they could and have things located in a more centralized location. So our initial discussions were with this particular customer revealed that, uh, you know, obviously he needed this dedicated network. And so our design was able to provide him this dedicated network according to the standards and so forth uh, and also allow him to uh, deploy one with a high level of security and, and uh, not only to the physical infrastructure but um, for logical security into the network as well. Um, he was a one-man band. This, you know, when I was walking around the plant with him, he was constantly getting pulled off to the side by everybody that needed, uh, hey, I need you to take a look at this machine real quick. So he was getting pulled in 100 different directions constantly. Uh, so it was very difficult for him to focus on one thing of, of this magnitude especially. So we took on all those design responsibilities and uh, collaborated with him based on his needs and ultimately took a big chunk of uh, the uh, work that needed to be done off of his shoulders and uh, were able to help him out that way. Uh, plus, he admittedly did not have the technical expertise specific to structured cabling. Um, and obviously, we do. This, this is what we do. We provided the complete uh, standards compliant design elements specific to every environment. Uh, and there were multiple different uh, 
types of environments in this particular plan as well. And on top of that, he had strict budget constraints. So what we agreed to is that we would do a holistic design, but be able to break it down for him in phases so that he could execute it as, um, as money opened up. So to this day, he's still actually uh, performing a lot of those upgrades now. And I guess the plan is probably within about the next two years, the overall plant design will be complete. So the process actually begins with mapping out the uh, equipment architecture that's needed for any individual plant. Um, and what we do is we want to identify the actual reach of, of each of the endpoint nodes, uh, the noise conditions, so we're specifying the right type of cable, uh, protection of the new zone enclosures, where's the best locations for those to go. And then ultimately with this assessment or this on-site data collection activity prior to our design engagement, we come back with all the information we need to actually start to put pen to, you know, pen to paper and actually start the design, uh, which we'll go into a little bit more in detail as far as what the design deliverables are. But in essence, it's a completely full uh, constructible design package that will uh, provide every element that, that's needed to install this infrastructure uh, for use for day one and also expandability. Uh, you know, we're looking at that 20-year mark, so this is something that could likely last 20 years and beyond if it's executed and installed correctly. Um, so the focus on the physical uh, network design actually starts uh, in all aspects of the network. So we're looking at every room where, you know, from the IT server room out to uh, the endpoint and everything in between. So as we're walking through, we're literally drawing, you know, marks on site copy plans and figuring out where the best place is for all these components to go and uh, routing pathways and also determining what is the best suitable products to be used uh, that would be protected long term in this overall design. So the design deliverables provided a, a complete uh, constructible package, uh, which is a multiple sheet set of drawings for uh, space planning, um, room layouts, uh, physical locations of all these enclosures, uh, overhead routing, uh, details of how the cable needs to be supported, details of how the uh, zone enclosures need to be mounted, whether it's directly to a steel wall or a column or, you know, anything in between. And in, in this case, we, we determined some locations where the, the customer was going to have to fabricate some steel structure, which he had resources within his uh, own workforce to be able to do. So it was, it was, really, it was really neat to have, have that, those kind of resources available to where we could specify the best place for these locations and they could provide adequate support for those. Um, so with that, we provided the uh, not only the full set of drawings, but the written specifications uh, for all the work that needed to be performed and a complete list of materials. So once that deliverable went out, he basically had the whole model kit without the, without the actual material and parts, but had a complete list of materials provided to where he could say, okay, I want to do this area of this, this particular unit, so I need this much uh, product and was able to do that either with his own forces or hire out a subcontractor to do that. Um, so I guess in, in kind of summary, the steps for the design include the data collection, which if it's a greenfield, it's done largely on drawing plans, uh, but with collaboration with the customer's requirements. Uh, if it's in, the, in this particular case, this was an existing plant. So we literally walked out every inch of every unit and uh, did the data collection, again, like I said before, to, to identify all routes, locations, and, and every detail of, of everything that needed to happen in this particular design. So step two is where we would actually begin the design activities and start continuing to work uh, directly with the customer so we don't just leave and design it and then hand it back to them when we're done. It's done uh, with uh, very strong collaboration with the end user and the client all throughout the process. Uh, and then we deliver the uh, drawing packages in, in various phases as set out in our statement of work. So he approves one section of it, we move on to the next, so on and so forth. And finally, once the whole project is done, 
uh, all the documents are issued in the 100% uh, completion stage and stamped for construction. So at that point, he can issue it to a general contractor or a low voltage contractor or use his own forces to actually use it as an uh, instruction guide to do the installation correctly. So at the end of the day, the uh, winner was that he was uh, uh, able to, to get a uh, very, very robust uh, physical infrastructure design uh, that he had a, a huge part in determining how it was done, but not having to actually specify all the technical nuances of, of how it was going to be laid out. That was our job. So with our agreement and collaboration with him, it, it was able to speed up the deployment. Uh, it provided him, him the risk mitigation he needed for the downtime. Uh, significant redundancy in case there was a uh, you know catastrophic failure of one of the links and obviously reliability and safety were a big uh, factor in in the end result of this um, so we look at the two standard models of how these uh, projects are typically done and one is uh, kind of illustrates if an end user was were to do it all on his own these are all the specific steps that he would take to do it uh, the integrated deployment that we're talking about uh, actually eliminates a few of these steps and, and reduces uh, time to market and time to deployment uh, because the pre-configured solutions that we specify and use where, where appropriate in any given plant environment. So it was actually uh, able to save them 75 percent time in actually deploying this and, and uh, uh, so at the end of the day, he was quite happy with the, with the result of all this. Um, so basically, the uh, pre-configured solution that we're talking about includes a zone enclosure, uh, which is uh, fully self-contained. And it's able to accept the inbound fiber connectivity and the outbound copper downlinks. And so this is the end point within a plant, which remains part of what we would call the permanent infrastructure. And then where you see the control panels, these would be um, connections uh, typically via copper. If they were beyond a 90 meter limit, we would specify a horizontal fiber run for those. But in essence, those would provide connectivity to all the endpoints in and around the, uh, the plant environment. So um, the moral of the story um, is, uh, you know, as Jim mentioned, and I think Jim, I'll hand it back to you at this point. We were talking about uh, the lessons learned and the uh, overall strategy and execution of uh, proper design. Well, thank you, Alan. Yes, so the it's vision, strategy, and execution. Making sure everybody's on the same sheet of music, all the stakeholders' needs, um, whether they're IT or controls or the uh, the line units, all have uh, important needs, and those need to be brought into the the vision, and then creating an overall strategy, and then being able to then execute on that strategy in either um, one project or maybe it's a phase project is uh, is the next real step is then being able to make a deployment and you know recommendation here is to leverage the prepackaged technologies so it's factory tested and using proven systems and then working with your supply chain and that's really uh, another key factor of this whole success was the collaborative effort between uh, our customer uh, Rockwell Automation, um, uh, distribution, and uh, other groups and products uh, within the uh, uh, Panduits. Um, so that uh, is really, I think, the, the story is get all your stakeholders, have a common vision, develop your strategy, and then use these modular building blocks for your execution. Great, thanks. Uh, thanks, Jim, Alan. Uh, that was a, a wonderful presentation. Are you uh, ready to take on some questions from the audience? Absolutely. Okay. So um, 
Audience members, please type your questions for today's presenter in the Ask a Question box on your screen. Uh, we'll get to as many questions as we can. Questions will be answered verbally during this Q&A, and then a few days from now this presentation will be available for on-demand viewing. And we'll post the archive on the Control Engineering website and send you an email message with a link connecting directly to it after it's ready. Now on to our questions. Uh, first question, how is the uh, physical infrastructure verified perfor for performance after the installation is completed? Okay, yeah, so um, while we're specifying the actual cable placement and, we're, and the actual cable types uh, in our design deliverables, part of the written specifications that we provide are the actual installation guidelines, which we include a uh, very uh, stringent section regarding uh, certification testing for not only all the fiber cable but all the copper cable. Uh, so we also write into the specifications what the requirement is of the subcontractor to provide the documentation for those tests. And we uh, actually write that down to the actual test equipment required to do the testing, whether it's a specific piece of equipment for fiber versus a certification uh, instrument used to test the copper. So those all become part of the required submittals from the contractor as part of their uh, award to do the installation. So with that, the certifications are done. And as the company Panduit receives the certification documents to verify that they're all uh, compliant and within the uh, industry standards as far as specifications for test requirements. Good. And, um Audience members, you can continue to submit your questions. I clicked over to the resource slide, which provides some additional information while we're doing the Q&A. Um, here's the information. Just go ahead and, and uh, type your questions into the, uh, the uh, console and click Send, and we'll get to the, the questions as we go. But uh, we'll, we'll show the uh, resource slide for now. Uh, how are the, the predetermined budgets aligned with scalability requirements when you're assessing a, a project? Well, I think it's very important when you perform the assessments that you, um, you know, identify the requirements and you can easily put together a design that's modular in its approach um, and that also meets the individual budget requirements. So there's, it's a trade-off, um, you know, based upon, you know, re the requirements from the, uh, the customer. And also it's an education process for him to understand the impacts for making certain choices. And, uh, you know, a lot of times that will, you know, drive him to want more redundancy or discover that he doesn't need as much uh, resilience in certain areas and then he can put together a plan that is executable. So it's um, the plan stage, you know, can take into account almost anything, and then it's breaking it down into uh, to steps that are implementable and that meet his budget. Um, I appreciated seeing the, the network diagrams. That was very instructive. Um, how are the, the ring topologies for pathway redundancy determined, and, and doesn't that require a, a rich uh, hardware uh, specification and investment? Yes, yeah, so when we go into an opportunity and we have the discussions with the, with the client as far as what their redundancy requirements are, we take into consideration uh, also obviously it kind of rolls into the previous question about budgets. So we're not going to design something that we know the customer can't afford, but at the same time, uh, we will design the infrastructure to support expandability. So if they were going to add redundancy later, they're able to do so. Uh, as far as the rich hardware selection, uh, again, that comes down to the budgets of the customer. Typically what we see is a lot of uh, off-the-shelf unmanaged switches, which they know are really inadequate for what they're needing to migrate to. So almost inherently, they've already accepted the fact that they have to uh, spend a little bit more money on a, a higher level uh, of a switch and so forth. And when we start to introduce our uh, integrated solutions, uh, the type of switches, which are industrialized switches that come in there, are t are always able to support that that type of hierarchy. So uh, usually that's not a problem. 
Alan, a, a related question. When you have a self-healing ring uh, like that and, and one segment is cut, does the process continue without interruption? Is it, is it truly bumpless? Yes, it is. Um, so if we're specifying the correct switch in the zone enclosure, it would actually have two uh, fiber uplinks. So seamlessly one can be disconnected, uh, either literally just unplugged, or actually cut, and it would still receive uh, and report data back and forth. So it adds at least a stopgap measure for that one particular segment. So if we lay it out in a ring topology and one of those fibers is cut you know, mid-span, then it's back fed from either direction uh, back to the micro data center location. As long as we've designed um, that redundancy into the design by the customer. So again, that comes down to their budget. So if we had a customer that really could only afford to run a single fiber out to a, a particular zone enclosure, if that cable were to get cut, then obviously everything hanging off of that zone enclosure would be down. But um, again, based on budgets and, and uh, redundancy, uh, we're able to do that seamlessly, yes. And, and that's the case for laying it out differently within the plant, so the same forklift doesn't cut the same three cables. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. It, it could rip one of them out. And, and also, by the way, when I say redundancy, we also look at it as completely discrete redundant pathways as well. So while it's helpful to have two separate cables connected to two points on side A and side B, it may not be helpful if they're both routed in the same exact uh, route and space because both of them will get cut at the same time. So we look for opportunities to uh, create diverse paths for these cables too, to, to mitigate risk of both cables getting cut by one event. Sure. Here's a question about best practices. Um, what are your top three best practices when integrating uh, multiple OEM skids and machines, each with their own I.O. network and unmanaged switches? There's a lot of diverse stuff out there. Well, um, there's lots of ways to, to integrate um, a solution. It's really like, I'll go back to my requirements again, is, you know, what are the requirements, what are the performance needs? Um, it comes down to, you know, you can use a hardware separation, um, you know, using a structured cabling approach and um, using the right uh, switches um, to, to set up the, um, the individual um, OEM skids. Um, you can also utilize some uh, some software approaches. Um, so you can use uh, some VLANs for, for separation. Um, one of the more popular um, ways that I like to use uh, um, integration of OEM equipment if they're common skids and they have unmanaged switches is to use something with a NAT functionality that allows all the uh, I.O. networks to be uh, configured the same with the same IP address and then they uh, use the uh, network access table to uh, to change them at an upper level. So the OEM doesn't have to change his uh, um, IP addressing scheme and it's just done at the, uh, the other level. And it's also very important to look at, you know, firewall and security um, uh, circumstances, but regardless, uh, you know, you use the same structured cabling approach with all of those, and then you just choose the level uh, whether you want to use a hardware or a software solution, or you know, use a, uh, a switch selection type criteria. Great, thanks. We're almost out of time, but um, uh, can you touch on how SIL two and SIL three requirements affect the, the network top topology? Yes, no, take it offline. Let's, let's take that one, um, that one offline. Okay, great. Well, thanks okay. a lot for the, the great information uh, relayed here. We had a very productive Q&A session. Uh, thank you very much to our speakers, James Niwetti and uh, Alan McFarlane, for sharing their time and uh, expertise here today. And um, thank you also to our, our webcast sponsor, uh, Panduit, for sponsoring today's event and relaying this great information. Uh, now that we're just about done, we want to hear how we did. The exit survey will pop up on your screen as soon as the webcast ends. Please take a moment to complete it as we use this information to improve our, our webcasts.
On behalf of CFE Media and Control Engineering, thanks for attending this webcast, Copyright 2014, CFE Media. This concludes our webcast. Thank you very much.